you're a corporate emo? Oh, you mean dashboard professional. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my God. I hate that, but I I love it too. It's just it's too good. I, we're you're definitely dashboard professionals. Dashboard like... professional, one hundred percent. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Seriously Loco, the seriously crazy fan podcast for El Paso Locomotive FC, a proud member of the Beautiful Game Network and brought to you by Roughneck Scarves and Icarus FC. I'm your host, Phil Baki, and I'm joined tonight by my co-host, Mika Burrell. Mika, uh, how you... Well, we talked a little bit about our Monday before <laughs> before we started recording, but uh, it's been kind of a rough, rough weekend, rough start to the week. Yeah, no, just a terrible Monday, I have to say. Um, just, like, classic quintessential case of the Mondays today. Nothing would go right, like, all the way up to my headphones being dead right before we started recording. So, you know, the the weekend carrying over to the week, but hopefully from here <laughs> we'll get some catharsis and, and, and keep going. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, yeah, my colleagues at work... Uh, in about as you know, they 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 were as error prone as, as the locomotive, unfortunately, this week. Ouch! <laughs> um, but <laughs> <laughs> before before we dive into to locomotives, uh, Darby Darby loss uh, this weekend, and um, and looking ahead to Las Vegas Lights, all while answering some of your your listener questions along the way. Um, I do want to just get some admin out of the way. So uh, if you're finding our podcast for the first time, um, welcome. And hopefully, uh, hopefully you enjoy the episode if you do. And if you're listening to us, you know, at all, um, you can find us on your favorite podcast platform. And if that platform allows you to rate or review the podcast, we would really love if you, uh, if you dropped a review and, and a rating, um, it does really help more, more people find it. And uh, as well, we've got our, our Patreon going. Um, so patreon.com slash seriously loco. Uh, check us out there. We are, we've dropped a bunch of articles about, about the new players who have joined um, in the off season. And we're going to keep, keep the, the content coming there. Uh, Mika also has a piece up um, on the things we learned about locomotive after that initial loss to Sac Republic. Um, and there's going to be a lot more along the way. So um, if you are at all interested in in seeing more, um, consider dropping a couple of bucks a month um, for for you know first access to the content. Um, but if not, totally fine. Um, and all the content unlocks at the, at the after a couple of days, um, and you can see it even it's it's all eventually free. Um, so no worries if if you're not. Uh, able to to drop the money but um yeah really appreciate all of our patron support um you guys are are legendary and mika i found myself on our patreon having put on a vpn uh to watch some sky sports clips uh in england (laughs) and (laughs) i went to our patreon and was like pounds what's happening here like why why is it telling me that we have subscribers that are paying us pounds um and i thought i thought maybe it was uh the influence of our of our british contingent um <laughs> at locomotive but uh no fortunately just the vpn well, playing we tricks on me we do have manny sanupe and one of the brock banks kindly subscribed and i know that they get charged like a weird amount because it converts from pounds it charges so. vat as well ouch <laughs> wow so credit to them real legends uh for <laughs> for supporting um and we'll probably get on we'll probably get on to some chat about sanupe a, a bit later um but mika as we as we dive into this the seriously loco match review El Paso Locomotive 1, New Mexico United 2. 
at at Southwest University Park in front of a reportedly a sellout crowd. It did look extremely full down there at the swap as well. Um, this is a tough one um, because once again, it does have the feel of El Paso Locomotive having perhaps the better of play definitely in the first half, but still succumbing to, to a couple of goals um, in what seemed like easier to deal with situations and, uh, and unfortunately coming away with the loss, despite, um, despite what many would say was the better of the play. Yeah. I mean, it's always, it's always tough to lose the Derby. It's always tough to lose at home. Always tough to lose at your first game at the swap. Um, I mean, Hutch was pretty unequivocal in, in the post game press conference. He said he felt like he, someone had you know taken his dog is how he put it or he lost his dog so i mean very very subdued atmosphere um in the press conference after the game and certainly at full time at the whistle the the place was full it was a sellout and boy does it sound extremely loud when all those people are are booing so um yeah it's always tough to to come away with a result like this against new mexico united especially when you do feel like um in some moments of play we deserve more um, and statistically, <laughs> um, I felt sick looking at the numbers afterwards, just how how much we controlled proceedings and come away, you know, with a loss and feeling pretty dejected, feeling pretty sorry for ourselves. So, yeah, it's tough, but um, I think I think we knew that, you know, there was going to be some growing pains. Um, and that's another thing that Hutch is pretty clear about is that he he, he says this is not a real rebuild that he doesn't believe in that kind of thing that this is just you know a new era for the club and it is but you know we have had nine new players walk through the door a lot of people not fit um, a lot of change backroom staff's completely different um, you know half half of the new backroom staff are, are are from elsewhere Mark has taken a lot of people with him to Indy Eleven so just a lot of change. Um, and yeah, but you know, in the meantime, and you know, the instant reaction is this one hurts for sure. Yeah. And it, it is especially tough because I think as we'll, as we'll talk about, um, and maybe we can just, maybe we can just dive in is there, there was a lot to come away from this match with in, in a positive sense, which is going to sound strange again, um, given I know we had a similar conversation after the Sac Republic loss, but looking into the good and looking at, at some of the positive aspects of, of this match um, in that first half. And particularly, I think maybe, maybe one of the things that I want to, that I want to highlight maybe about, about the broad performance here is, and maybe this played into the, the dominant first half versus the naive second, as, as you put it, um, the, at nil nil and and at one nil uh after after locomotive had taken the lead, the lead um locomotive had a lot of space um as we talked about on the preview i talked about the fullbacks or the wingbacks for new mexico united bombing on and and being an opportunity for locomotive to get in behind um, and the idea of you know Sanupe and Francois running running at that back three with with the support of you know in this case uh, Ricky um, through the center that all like I think it we saw it play out and and I don't you know say this to like whatever pat myself on the back for analysis it's just like kind of the obvious thing where if they play these these wing backs it leaves sort of this natural room for our wingers to to exploit and we did to good effect. Um, you know, Sanupe should have two assists. Uh, Christian Francois, like somehow <laughs> fails to connect with a chance, you know, about four yards out it, with an open net uh, to aim at. But either way, at nil nil one nil, we had the space on the on the flanks. Um, we saw shortly after the opener, we saw Diego Luna crack the post. Uh, you know, exploiting a wide area and and um. We were pressing high. We were winning the ball high up the field. Um, so there were a lot of things that were going exactly right. And then this long ball over the top, 
just before, yo, again, like later in the ha- last 10 minutes of the half, um, ball over the top. And we'll talk about, we'll talk about the equalizer, you know, in more detail, but at one, one, we saw, and at halftime really with the game going into half at one, one, we saw a total shift from the United in terms of they were fine with one, one, like they were fine to make that the result. And we saw the wingbacks drop back and they played effectively a back five, like the rest of the match. So Sanupe and Francois like really struggled to assert themselves the rest of the match. And that shift emphasizes so much about this, about this hutch tactic is that like, there are certain aspects of it that are really going to work when we're level with like when we're starting at nil nil or when we're beating teams because they are going to want to come out and play most most of the teams that we that we face are going to want to come out and attack and play and try to you know try to go out and win the game and we've shown at nil nil or one nil that we're often like in control better team uh creating a lot of chances we saw it against Sac Republic. We've seen it again against New Mexico United. But the second the game state changed in favor of our opponent, which was down to, again, like as we talk about it, we kind of undermined ourselves. As soon as the game state changed to something our opponent was happy with, then like their approach shifts significantly. Um, and in both cases, like halftime signaled this big shift of they were willing to go more defensive. They they're like, we're getting absolutely eaten alive, like down the wings. We're going to put in, like, we're going to shift, bring our wing backs. You know, we're not going to have Bruce and, and Swartz like bombing on like they did in the first half. And then, yeah, Sanupe and Francois like struggled to, to yeah, get anything out of, out of the game in the second half. So really, at the end of the day, like what this comes down to is like, we can't let, we can't let the good work that we're doing or, or really we can't let the game state change in favor of our opponent by our own mistake or by our own, our, our own issues, because it really undermines the game plan for the rest of the match. Yeah, no, I think everything you said there is, is fair enough. And I think that's why, for example, the Diego Luna strike off the post or, or the ball kind of hopping up on, on Francois and him somehow not putting that away, that's why those those near misses hurt so much because we know that New Mexico United is going to shut up shop, right? We And that's and that, that's smart. That's a smart thing to do on the road. Like, yeah. I don't necessarily blame him. Um so that's why it becomes so important to take those chances when they arise because then if the game state does change, you've got some insurance. Yeah. Right. Um, but yeah, 1-1, one, one, yeah, I mean, then then it's much more precarious. And I think you were right to point out the, the space that we had, and that was a good aspect of our play. Um, going, You know, Snoopy and Francois going beyond the fullbacks, they couldn't live with them. They really couldn't live with them. Neither could Sacramento. Um, you know, this is something I think we'll see, uh, so long as both those boys stay fit. Um, and yeah, it was giving us a lot of space, but at the same time, and you know, we'll get, uh, let's, I guess we have to talk about, you know, the, the, the equalizer when we get to this too, is at the same time, those wingbacks are a target for Tempakis or anyone in the back to yeah. play to them, to get forward immediately with the long ball. And, you know, that's what happened with the equalizer. The time block just clears it out to Bruce. It's a really good header into the path of Nico Brett. I have no idea why Andrew Fox doesn't contest that header. Yeah. Or contest, you know, that aerial duel. He's got several inches on his compatriot, to be fair to him. Mm-hmm. And, you know, from there, everyone's flat-footed. So, yeah, I mean, a combination of not taking the chances that we did have and the mistakes really... Uh, marred the night I think but we'll start out and we'll start on the positive let's let's talk Emmanuel Sanupe because a goal in the opener an assist in, in the second game and could have had could have had another assist um, um, with the Francois chance like you said feasting 
down that right hand side and every ball in behind he just looked so so dangerous and especially when he gets the ball to his feet and is running at people um he he really looks capable and it's not just about a speedy winger he's already proven in these first two matches that he's got end product too and that ball in for francois was unbelievable like the ball for the cutback for dylan was one thing but that curled ball into the path of francois was just next level absolutely yeah i mean he's he's on another level i think we felt that from his debut i mean just the way he carries himself the way he moves like he understands the game in a way that his opponents don't many of his opponents don't and that comes from you know having played in in the lower levels of england having come through tottenham hotspurs academy just a really, really classy player and so many years ahead of him, too. I mean, it's incredible what he's been able to put together in such a short time. Um, and, and happy birthday to the guy, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> it's his, uh, <laughs> happy birthday. It's his birthday today. Um, so, yeah, he's been excellent. And long may it continue because we need him, you know. Um, and, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know what else to say. He's been just great. He, he He's one of those players that – you kind of hold your breath a little bit when he gets on the ball because it just really feels like something something could happen. And that's what I really like about him is he's a constant threat. Um, and, and New Mexico United really couldn't live with him until, like you said, they decided to put more bodies behind the ball and, and kind of clog up those, those wide areas that he's used to attacking into. But, I mean, he combines really well with other players too. The fact that Luna found him so well for the first goal, like yeah. completely cut through half the the united team uh to play in through uh yeah just it's incredible what kind of connections he's been able to make uh with his teammates in such a short time so yeah just everything about the the goal that he set up was really classy and and dylan maris i mean (laughs) what a finish yeah you know opens his body up curls it into the top corner uh, into the roof of the net and he becomes you know that's the other good thing that came out of this one is he becomes a top scorer in the Derby del Camino Real so congratulations to Dylan um and uh yeah and I and I brought that up to him in the pros game and uh you know he was happy to have helped the team but we know what a team player he is and much rather would have liked to have the three points so but it's just nice that that he's been so productive for us in, in these you know important games yeah, it, and I mentioned on on Twitter uh, during the match that, and at the time when he scored the goal, that he he doesn't need to put it into the top corner. He doesn't need to roof it. Like he's got almost the entire goal to aim at, <laughs> and yet he puts it in the upper ninety, like absolutely like unsavable. Um, uh, so yeah. It, it's a it's a fantastic finish. It was it was needed in terms of you know we just kind of fluffed our lines on a big chance and he he's it making that late run as as you love uh, into the box. But the interesting thing about Dylan in this one and and probably more so what was interesting about his post match comments was the fact that he looks almost completely different from the player that we saw last season where he was, you know, he's deployed in, in the 10 he's deployed in midfield. He's deployed in, you know, on the wing, like pseudo winger, false nine, whatever. He played a handful of different roles. He's got his role in midfield next to Diego, which the two of them seem to be, you know, those guys in, in central midfield, those roaming eights or tens, however, however you, uh, look at it. Um, and he looks right at home there. Yeah, I, I have to say when we saw him alongside Diego for the Sacramento match, my concern, I guess, was is that too much running? Is that too much box-to-box for him? Because, you know, he's he's not old, but he's not a spring chicken either. Sure. Um, and, and, and we already – plus we already knew that there was issues with fitness all, all around the squad. So – um, but it hasn't seemed to be an issue for him. And, and we do have a, a listener question that kind of talks about this balance later on, but so far it doesn't seem to be an issue for him playing in a role that w- requires him to cover more ground at, you know, as well as arrive late and, and score goals, yeah. um, which he's done. So, you know, credit to him. Um, he said 
pretty effusively that he loves playing alongside Diego. He feels that he's being utilized properly, which was a revelation to me, <laughs> to be fair. Like, yeah. he was pretty unequivocal in the fact that he didn't like how much he was being uh, moved around on the pitch uh, in, in seasons past. So um, he seems to feel really good with the way that, that John Hutchinson is using him, and, and it shows in his play. He's been very, very good. I think uh... – and I can't, you know, I can't remember if this is something we said on the pod or said in in our in our group chat, but I think we we did comment on the fact that Dylan Dylan seemed to be basically the and, and I'll you know I use this term, but he seemed to be kind of the victim of of Diego Luna's uh you know emergence and combined with the re signing of Sebastian Velasquez. And, and in Lowry's system, all three of those players played the same position. So he really had trouble finding that spot for Dylan. In Hutch's system, those players, well, you know, Diego and, and Dylan ostensibly play the same position, but Velasquez has found this new home as, as a false nine or, you know, roaming playmaker, however you want to <laughs> describe that position. So he's really found a way for all three of them to fit into this into the squad, which which unfortunately like mark never really found the answer to that right yeah um because yeah we all think of the three of them as attacking midfielders and and i think that's a credit to hutch that he's been able to to field them together hasn't resulted in a win yet to yeah. be fair um and uh, yeah i think that's really interesting that you bring up the kind of him kind of being a victim to to Luna's breakout because our colleague uh, Joe from the striker asked him that you know it seemed like you guys are getting in each other's way had a lot of the same ideas and and that's where Dylan kind of said yeah I, I did not like the way that we were or that I was being played and uh, um, I I think Luna and I actually really uh, complement each other uh, basically so yeah. and and it, and that shows. Um, and and both of them are very exciting, and in in fact, even in the goal, it kind of shows the the balance that they have because D uh, Luna's way in midfield in like a traditional eight spot when he makes that play, yeah. And then Dylan's already starting to to arrive, you know, seconds later to score the goal. So it seems like they've worked out the balance among each other. Who's going to stay? Who's going to go? Um, you know, in attacking phases. So that's encouraging to see for me. Well, and I think I think one of the things to point out too, along with like, hey, we haven't had the results that we've wanted. Uh, when we're praising the midfield, I mean, let's be real, the midfield hasn't really been involved in in a lot of the goals that we've conceded because most of them have come from balls over the top. Like they've bypassed the midfield. So I think one of the criticisms that could come out of, you know, when you see two guys like Dylan and Diego next to each other in a midfield, you could say, Hey, it feels a little light, but we haven't seen team. We haven't seen teams who are able to play through it yet. Like from a defensive standpoint as well, it's all been hit it over the top and, and really hope that you can get someone in behind it. Rarely, like rarely have we seen someone, you know, put together a move that, that really cuts through that midfield. Yeah. And on top of that, you know, to your point, we outperformed New Mexico and in virtually every every on the ball statistic, I mean, yeah. vastly possessed the ball over them, outpossessed them, made more passes, controlled proceedings in midfield. So yeah, I mean the numbers bear that out as well. But I also think that, you know, while Diego and, and Dylan have been the, the two starters, I think the that six role is still very much up for grabs. We saw Richie uh, start, you know, in, in California. And then of course, Calvillo started, um, on Saturday. So I think that's still the question mark and, yeah. and, and maybe a, a team that is more willing to, to play with the ball on the ground might expose, um, maybe some deficiencies there, or at least maybe not deficiencies, but at least like a lack of chemistry maybe, uh, yeah. in the unit as a whole. But yeah, I think, I think you're absolutely right that it's not really been the issue. Yeah. Um, as we kind of get on to the not so good, but yeah. <laughs> and, and you mentioned Calvillo. I do think in this game, I would have liked to see him influence things maybe a little bit more. And it's not necessarily a fault of his in that the way that we play does emphasize the fullbacks. It emphasizes the wingers and, and it does, 
you know, sometimes the play kind of exists in wide areas rather than, than playing through the center. Um, but I think I would just like to see him be somewhat of that, almost like a, that kind of metronomic presence in, in midfield where the ball goes to him and it's distributed out. Um, and he just keeps things ticking. I think Richie has been that traditionally. And, and, um, this match is not a great example to be honest, because Richie comes off the bench and I I think he kind of, he has a, a bit of a shocker. <laughs> like he, he gave the ball away kind of a lot. Um, but we've seen Richie do that in the past where, you know, he's the one that, that is really transitioning things from, from defense into attack. And he plays those kind of one time, like no look passes that, that keep things moving. Um, and I, yeah, I, I would look for Calvillo to maybe, to maybe, um, be a little bit more of a presence in the future, but, um, but the midfield wasn't the big talking point uh, of this one. And as you said, as we get on to the maybe not so good, um, the two goals um, for New Mexico United, I think it's it's impossible to, to really point at them without saying like, hey, mistakes were made. Um, and, and in this case, there's, there's maybe, we'll talk for the, you mentioned for the equalizer, there's a couple of mistakes in defense before things get to, to the goalkeeper. But, there, there is, uh, you know, I mean, let's call a spade a spade. There's a mistake in in goal as well on the on the Nico Brett um, equalizer. Yeah, I mean, I I think it's a procession of mistakes that lead to the equalizer. Like I kind of alluded to earlier, the ball that Tambakis plays over the top to Bruce, someone has to contest that. I mean, yes, you ostensibly doesn't look like a, a dangerous area. It's, you know, right into midfield. But with the way that they play, with the wing backs being so influential, like you have to be alert to that. And I think that Andrew Fox could have stepped up. He's got several inches on Daniel Bruce. I don't know why he doesn't try to intervene there. We, yeah. You know, he's one of the taller players on the team. So, and I think... To be fair to Foxy, I think he felt that too <laughs> in some of his post-game comments. I think he felt that he and, and all his teammates could have been better there. Um, but, you know, fair play to Bruce. He he heads it on right into Nico Brett's path. The entire defense is flat-footed. There's no way, you know, Harry Brockbank playing out of position. God bless him. He's not a center back. Um, he's more of a right back, as, as we know. Yeah. He and Agilus, like, they allow Nico Brett into that space between the two of them, and they're both flat-footed, and neither one can, can keep up. And then the big big mistake comes, too, of course, with Evan Newton, who, for me, this is a, a decision-making error um, in that if you watch the replay, uh, you know, first of all, Evan's already in no man's land. We know he's, like, way far out. But you see the attacker bearing down on you. You have to make a decision. Are you going to retreat and try to stop the shot and you know make yourself big in the goal, or are you going to make yourself big and rush at the, the ball? He starts to rush and then retreats, which you know you're moving backwards, so like your momentum is going to be just off. And you know before he can really even make the next decision, Nico Brett is arcing the ball over his head, yeah. and he's just watching it sail past. And, you know, that's like three mistakes in a row right there. Yeah. Failing to contest the ball in the air, being caught flat-footed, and letting the, the, the attacker slip between the two center backs, and then not making a decision one way or another about how you're going to make the save or attempt to. So, <laughs> yeah, um, it's brutal. It's absolutely brutal. And is it something that we maybe could expect from a side that are still trying to get to know each other. Maybe, maybe so, but these are also all experienced players. Yeah. Um, and I think that we could expect better on that. Um, and, and, you know, it was just naive. It was naive and clumsy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think, I think you've, I think you've captured it well there. And unfortunately, unfortunately for Evan Newton, uh, it wasn't the end of, of the, the night, um, in terms of things that potentially could have been better. Um, the second goal from, from Taborty Taka is, is 
born of a, a, a back pass is played to, to Evan Newton. He's, he's pressed by a New Mexico United defender and he kind of just plays like a, a pass straight up the middle um, into, I mean, there's really no locomotive players in the area and, and uh, it creates an immediate chance for, for New Mexico United. It's, uh, it, it's finished off quite easily um, in the end by, by Itaka, who ends up kind of one-on-one because Boehner is trying to like get back to the goal line and offer some like additional protection. Um, Boehner, of course, like brought on at, at halftime as well uh, for, for Siobhan John Brown, who like, so that they could move Harry Brockbank out of center back out to the, out to the flanks. And um, anyways, so Evan Newton in this case, I mean, it, obviously you're under pressure, tough to tough to pick the right pass, but one of those, one of those cases again, where it's like the decision to play that pass, like it's just not really an option. Cause there's really nothing on like, if you, if you're being pressed as the keeper, it's sometimes it's fine just to, to boot it long. Yeah, and I think that's where he'll have to find that balance because as we as we know as we've kind of spoken about it feels like Ed Nazem even though it's been only two matches, he's being asked to do this. Yeah. But at the same time like you do have to have your professional discretion, right, and say this is a dangerous situation, let me boot it long. And actually I don't know that it was even the most dangerous like set of circumstances. It's a very bad pass like yeah he the person he seems to be aiming for is diego luna who and that was extremely ambitious because diego is pretty much at the halfway line yeah uh and i i don't remember who it was who nips in and and has the time to find that that that's where the ball's gonna go i think it was maybe swartz or someone um and you know it had having first ricocheted off i think nico brett's boot and then like you said to is able to, to to slide it home pretty easily um, I think five hole too, which just adds insult to injury. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's just poor. It's poor. And we asked, we asked Touch about it, of course, after um, after the game, and I had to be the one to ask about Evan <laughs> Newton. Thanks a lot, locomotive. But um, <laughs> no, Hutch was really, you know, for in, considering the circumstances, he was actually really quite, um you know, pleasant for the most part, but very, very upset, obviously, with the result. But he said, you know, if 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 Evan makes a mistake, that's also on me because I'm asking him to do this, and it is what it is. But, you know, he also acknowledged that Evan's really not played first-team regular football since, like, 2020. Yeah. I believe when it, he was with Indy 11, or, you know, yeah. he got bounced around a couple of MS sides, really didn't make any appearances, um, and you know, he's just match rhythm is really important for players and especially for goalkeepers, you know, it's such a specialized position that you really do need that rhythm. And I don't know if, I mean, we'll see if we can afford to wait for him to get up to speed, right? It's only been two match days, but, um, it has to get better and quick, uh, because, you know, he is the, the starter for, you know, for all intents and purposes and, um, you know, I, I actually did look at and compare his stats so far to Logan Ketterer, who we'll probably get on yeah. to for reasons that are pretty ugly, but they're actually really quite similar in terms of, um, how they started their careers at Locomotive and kind of their, their, uh, expected conceded goals to actual conceded and all that kind of thing. And, you know, I know some people think that's really like woo woo and like the, you know, advanced analytics, but they are informative. Yeah. Uh, and I thought it was really interesting how similar they were in some respects. So just food for thought, I guess. <laughs> um, I'm still willing to, to see where this goes, but yeah, it has been a really toward start for him. Yeah. And I mean, I think we've seen, you know, and, and again, uh, you know, you, we, we use examples from, from world football just to kind of like inform, you know, uh, or, you know, find context or, or historical examples of this sort of thing. But I think, I think, like you said, the rhythm and I mean, things can turn for a goalkeeper on, on a dime. Um, like their fortunes can change immediately. Um, 
And the reality is that confidence and like so much of, of a goalkeeper's especially one that's being asked to to sweep being asked to to be a part of the the build up play all the all those things that we would expect of a modern keeper so much of that is is down to like are they making that right split decision in that exact moment and if you don't have confidence in your decision making because you're second guessing yourself you're automatically now you're automatically caught in this loop of double checking each decision but you don't have the time to actually take that to make a decision so ultimately i think it can it can be a vicious cycle for goalkeepers and they have to have really short memories um unfortunately in this one difficult for evan to to kind of let it go because there were chants uh from from behind the goal um about to the to the tune of of we want Ketterer, um, and and then obviously as you mentioned before the boo the booze at full time. I mean, I'm not one to necessarily you know do a lot of fan criticism or anything like that, but this was this was disappointing from from the crowd at the swap. Yeah, you know the the booing. I mean, whatever. I you know. It, I want. I would have made, probably booed too if I if I could, but you know I was wearing my journalist <laughs> hat. But um, yeah, the the chanting. I, I just don't see how that helps, right? Um, yeah. He's still our player, and I think you know if you're going to the, the if you're going to the game if you're sitting in the supporter section, I'll, it's, uh, I assume you're a supporter, right? So support. Yeah. Right. Um, and that, and that's just my opinion. I mean, like that, you know, if I were there, that I would not be partaking in any, we want get her a chance. He's not coming back. Nope. And he also dropped a couple shockers when he was wearing locomotive colors. And I remember clear as day when people wanted to run Logan out of town and now he's, you know, quite revered <laughs> among the, the fan base and rightfully so. Cause he was an excellent player for us who made a couple mistakes and that happens. It's football. Um, so yeah, I, I'm not one either to to try and like police fan, you know, sentiment or whatnot. Everyone can make up their own mind, and that's perfectly fine. Um, but that that is ugly, and it was disappointing for sure. Um, and, and, it, and by no means was it like everyone. No, uh, you know, it was a couple people. Um, you know, and and so that that sucks <laughs> for sure. And I I hope Evan didn't hear it, but I don't know how he couldn't have. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. Like you said, he'll have to have a short memory because, you know, he's just we have to get right back to it on Wednesday, uh, yeah. and presumably he will start. So, uh, yeah, just just wanted to address that because I I think that's really ugly, and, and you know it kind of it kind of spilled over online too. Like there were a lot of like Ketterer memes and stuff, and it's just like, okay, like <laughs> you know. You have every right to feel that way, but it, does, it it he's not coming back. No, you know, so I don't know. Yeah, the um, and it was it was all audible on the broadcast too, which you know to me, really, the, yeah, like the booze especially, wow. but the the um the the Caterer chance. I mean, not they weren't like deafening by any stretch, but yeah, audible on the broadcast also because uh, wow. when you guys were talking about it, I could hear it watching from home. So yeah, that was. Um, Yikes. yeah, not isolated enough to be, you know, just heard in the stadium, I guess. Uh, and who knows where the crowd mics are or whatever, you know, versus whatever, or the field mics and, and all that stuff. But yeah, bottom line, I, I think obviously perspective here, and we'll talk more during the listener questions, but perspective is important. We're two games into the season. Is there stuff that needs to get better? Absolutely but there's a lot of good too. Um, so super disappointing loss. Um, but we've got a bunch of listener questions. We're going to answer those after we take a quick break. And then in the last segment, we'll talk the, the game uh, on Wednesday night against Vegas. Seriously loco listener questions. Welcome back to Seriously Loco. Uh, we are joined now by uh, by Christian Canales. Christian, welcome. 
What's up, guys? Hopefully this isn't becoming like a regular thing. I'd like to be on for the entirety, but, you know, stuff happens. <laughs> it's all life, good. Life it's, things. It's all good. Christian, we, we talked at the top of the show about how dog shit our Mondays were. Was your, was your Monday terrible? Yeah. I work in education, and so this was our first day back from spring break. And the very first email I open... It's like, oh, like, we made a mistake on your W-2. Like, correct it so, like, re get this form so you can resend it with your tax return. So I'm like, well, shit, I still haven't gotten my return yet. Is it because this was messed up? So I click on it, and apparently it was like a phishing test. So <laughs> first day back from two weeks out, and they're trying to <laughs> hoe me like that. And then I forgot to send this part to you guys, but... I got another email from legit saying like you've been enrolled in a, on a like cybersecurity training. I'm like, God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> they put me in the remedial class. <laughs> those damn. those IT like tests that's like the standardized testing for adults. Like they're, they're why are you making me do this? Yeah, <laughs> to make themselves feel important. You think oh you're big? <laughs> <laughs> oh well, guys, uh, we've we've got a bunch of listener questions now, um, and I think we'll we'll make our way through these. We want it at first. We were going to go through them, kind of in in our discussion of the New Mexico match, um, but instead. Everybody decided to get a little big big picture on us uh, after two games. They were getting con contemplative, um, so we are gonna we're gonna go through them in their own segment. Um, and we had kind of a common theme through a handful of the questions, but we we picked out two of them. And I'll uh, I'll throw this to the group, and maybe maybe I'll throw it to throw it to Christian first, being the being the newcomer. I'll, I'll, just throw it to you right out the gate like a fishing test. Um, so at Cool Fernie <laughs> on Twitter, and uh, he asked, "How long do we wait until we hit the panic button?" And uh, at NL Brown two thousand five on Instagram said, "So are we hitting the panic button on the keeper and defense? We leak goals. Um, so Christian, panic button or no?" Uh, so short answer is no. I, I don't feel like it's necessary to be hitting the panic button right now. It's literally been two games out of a. 34 game season 36 game season um and i think that because of how much success we had over the past three years that we've become very spoiled and we just need to step back and kind of put things in perspective you know after two games in 2019 shit was looking real grim too <laughs> um <laughs> so i think that everyone deserves time you know hush deserves time to figure this out um I think that the defense deserves time. I mean, this is a back line who has played even between the two games, you know, zero minutes together. The back line changed between the two games. Yeah. Um, and so I think that, that that's just something that we need to remember is that we are at the beginning of something. It's not a rebuild. And, you know, Hutch couldn't have been more clear about that. It's not a rebuild, but we're only two games in. Like, there's many games left to be played there's 90 plus points still on the table so just you know take a breather we'll figure it out it'll come together just chill <laughs> mika what do you think are we are we panicking yet i'm not panicking yet and um but at the same time like if you want to panic then by all means <laughs> i don't want to tell people how to feel but i'm not panicking uh, because it's like Christian said, everyone deserves time. Mark Mark started his first two games were a loss and a draw. I mean, it wasn't you know set the world alight type stuff. He started his career in Indy Eleven with two losses. So I mean, you know, not to to bring up the past or anything, but just you know that's the only reference point that we have. Um, so I'm not hitting the panic button yet. I think this is extremely normal. I expected it just. And even though I expected it, it doesn't mean it doesn't hurt. Of course it does. I hate losing. We all hate losing. Yeah. But um, it's not unexpected. Every There's so much change. 
There's so much change um, from match to match, you know. And now we're, you know, we're going to get onto it. We're, we're getting onto an international break. It's going to be even more change. We're going to be missing players because we've got such a quality squad. Their national teams want them, right? So um, I would say no if, if I had to kind of impose my will on others it's don't panic but because you know it's it's very early days um so that's all i have to say about it yeah i mean like you said history and and the fact that i think the thing i'm taking the most comfort in so far is that offensively in those first two games under lowry to be quite honest like i'm like Man, we're not going to score any goals. Like we just and we didn't score many goals in that in that first season in particular. Like we we defended quite well, but we didn't we didn't score really I mean, we didn't score much um in that first season. It obviously turned around with with the introduction of Kisa Vetter and and Velasquez and then into season 2 as as Josue Ron Gomez and uh, you know emerged as more of a more of a force. We've got like we've gotten off to such a good start in terms of chance creation, certainly not from a, you know, we, we can definitely do better in, in converting those chances, but there's no mystery about like, Hey, where are goals coming from? It's like, we know exactly where they're coming from. And, and we could have, and I know this is, you know, a big qualifying term, but I mean, there's, there's a universe out there where we leave these halves with, you know, these first halves against Sac Republic and against New Mexico with, I mean, three, four goals. Like, that's just the reality. The chances are there. Um, and if that's the case, like, the odds that we're losing these games with a three, you know, three goals or something like that, that's just not, that's not happening. So I think as we, as we progress, um, the chance conversion is going to come. Um, a few of the players, you know, it is, an unlucky bounce and you know Francois first time trying to convert a chance at the at the the infield end um it's not exactly the easiest to play a bouncing ball in front of in you know in front of uh at that eighth notch end of the field um with the the grass the way it is so anyways like as our players adapt as our players learn each other as they as they get more comfortable I think these chances are going to convert and and the reality is the defense needs time to gel as well. Um, but but the chances are there to win these games. And that makes me feel comfortable that the system will work. Um, you know, it's like, remember the Titans? Uh, Denzel Washington's character is like, <laughs> it's like Novocaine, just give it time. Like that's, a, you know. <laughs> One thing too I want to add is we've had all these chances and we haven't even played a recognized striker yet. So I mean, like... Yeah. Again, we just don't even have everyone available to us yet. So yeah, yeah. Lucho's gonna go dumb, go crazy once he once he gets in there. <laughs> go but, stupid. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, we've got another question from at Pedro on twenty twenty, no twenty two. Yeah, on Instagram, and he says, "What could be the reason as to why Los Locos aren't staying consistent with opportunities throughout the full ninety minutes?" So. I kind of took this question to mean like, why aren't we being consistent over the full ninety minutes in general? So, yeah. any thoughts, Phil, Christian? Yeah, I think I think I kind of touched on this in the in the first portion uh, when we were talking about the New Mexico match. But the reality is that like the other teams are going to adapt to the game state. So, like I said, you know, in in the case against New Mexico, they recognize that hey our wingbacks playing this high up the field, we're getting absolutely torched. Like, and there's a lot of opportunities for Sanupe and, and Francois to create in behind. And, uh, were they weren't playing with like their full, you know, their, their first choice center backs in, in some cases, either they had kind of a, a fill in, which in a back three, like, you know, you can kind of cover for some of the weaknesses of, of your center back. So it's not as highlighted. Um, but in that case, they knew they're getting cooked down the wings and they got gifted a goal at, you know, at one nil. So at one, one, New Mexico is totally happy with that result. They are, they are more than content to leave, to leave the swap with a draw. They 
retreat those fullbacks into those wide areas and just played extremely withdrawn from that point on, at least in the, in the back line, certainly their, uh, their forward line was still, you know, pressing and there's some, still some stuff going on there. Um, but as soon as they retreated the wingbacks into those defensive areas, it just nullified what, what Francois and Sanupe were able to do. And I think it is, a. Uh, I think it's a challenge for this locomotive squad because they play at such a high intensity, high, high pace, um, high tempo, I guess I should say that they, they do find it difficult to break down teams that are sitting deep and, and playing in that kind of low block. Like we've seen cause Sacramento adopted it, you know, after their torrid openings, you know, where they could have conceded four goals um, inside the first like 15 minutes. Um, and then similarly from New Mexico, we saw a deeper, a deeper defensive look once they were essentially protect, protecting the one, one draw. And that is the challenge for this locomotive squad is okay. We know how we can get in behind. We know how we can hit teams on the break. We know how we can transition quickly now it's now it's how do we break down those teams that are determined to defend deep and and sit back and that's a challenge that a lot of squads i mean not just in USL but a lot of squads internationally that's a problem that is tough to solve so i i think that's the challenge for for Hutch now is okay once a team's decided to sit deep how are we going to break that down and i think that will be i think that'll be something that they're looking at cuz they're like hey we've got this whole wing play thing figured out and, and, you know, Luna's ball through the defense, finding Sanupe. Like, we know how we can crack teams open who are playing up the pitch. Now, how do we break down those teams that have decided to sit a little deeper? Any thoughts, Christian, on the uh, kind of lack of consistency through 90 minutes? I mean, I, th- I think it's also, we can just also attribute it to everything we said before. I mean, everything is new. Um, you know, all of all of these, these players are, are still figuring out you know how to play together um it was a full preseason but like not really because we had so many late arrivals and so i think that it's hard to um be consistent and have that 90 minute rhythm when you're still learning how to play with each other so that i mean that's my thoughts on on the problems and i think that it'll get resolved through time the other the other thing that i think is worth calling out here is the fact that Hutch actually mentioned in the press conference, and you guys said this, that like he felt that we got away from the way that we want to play in the second half um, and that we kind of let New Mexico United get us to play the game that they wanted to play, which was really stop start, a lot of fouls, a lot of like really breaking things up. Um, And so we started to try to like go long, all this stuff. So anyways, like... Just a, just a thought too that hey, like there's probably a little bit of like composure that that's needed when we start to get frustrated or start to feel like we're not creating as much. Um, we need to show some patience in like hey, let's stick to the plan and and not and not try to throw everything away and just you know hoof it or or whatever we ended up doing in the end, which you know it it was inconsistent for sure. Well, with with that, um, talking about the system and talking about Hutch in particular. So Mavi G on Instagram asked, uh, when must Hutch start considering tweaking the system to provide more midfield support to the back four? So Mika, I mean, how are you feeling about the way the midfield is is playing with in regards to how we're defending? <laughs> the the way this question is phrased is really interesting because it's almost like the conclusions in the question like <laughs> when must he do this not should he right? right and um you know that's fair enough i think yeah if something's not working you have to make a change right again though extremely small sample size um and and like we kind of talked about it at the top and you know the first segment i don't know that midfield's necessarily been a glaring issue um you know it's been balls over the top that have kind of undone us and should there be more runners tracking back maybe um but i don't i don't 
I don't really blame midfield for any of the shortcomings that we've had necessarily. What I will say, though, is that I wanted more cover in the number six position because that's such a huge job when you're the lone six, uh, especially in the modern game where it's all about pace, right? Um, and, you know, we know Richie's classy on the ball, but he is one of the elder statesmen in the dressing room, and he, I don't know that he can play 90 minutes every week. Uh, Eric Calvillo is not tailor-made necessarily for that sixth position, and I and I was on the record about wanting another option there. So yeah. that that part of it does concern me a little bit. I mean, and under Luth, like he thinks of himself as a six, so that could be an option if we get more center back depth. But right now, even that's looking a little thin. Um, Harry Brockbank obviously had to deputize for, for Martin Bayares, who didn't dress for the game and took a knock uh, in Sacramento. So, yeah, I mean, with a full squad, it might be able to give you a, a bit more of a, an answer as to, like, the mi- midfield makeup, really, because I think it's still very much in flux. Um, but I, you know, I don't think that they've, like, let the back four, you know, let them hang out to dry or anything. Like, I think the the play is really not broken down there necessarily so um i don't think there's a tweak that needs to be made right now (laughs) but we'll just have to see how the midfield actually develops before we decide like hey they don't provide nearly enough cover uh christian i assume you don't have anything to say otherwise i'll do the next question yeah no 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 no. like i said if i feel like i need to chime in I'll, i'll turn on my camera or type something real quick all right cool so next question comes from at SG Contulis on Twitter. And he says, where are our players who aren't in the lineups? Are we only allowed six outfielders on the bench with five subs per game? (laughs) (laughs) Christian, where is everyone? Damn. (laughs) That's an excellent question, isn't it? We were talking about that just before, you know, Saturday's match. But, um, and, and then, you know, we, we were, we found out a few things and, um, you know, like we put on the Twitter, we found out that, Some people, uh, you know, just didn't have a great preseason. Not a great preseason, but they didn't have a very full preseason, a la Yuma. Um, So he's, you know, just trying to to get match fit, I would say. Uh, We know that Chapa had had some sort of minor procedure done, so he's he's recovering from that. Uh, Lucho, again, just another fitness issue, just trying to get get back into, you know, 90-minute form. Who else? I... Who else of note are we missing there that we haven't seen just yet? So, Chapa. I mean, those are the three big ones, I would say. Um, yeah. But everyone else, I think, has gotten a little bit of time, I think. Except yeah. Michael, but he's backup goalkeeper, so. And then Velasquez, you know, we saw him go off, and, um, you know, hopefully he'll be back sooner rather than later. But, I mean,. Just people are recovering, and that kind of goes back to what I said about, you know, this squad still having to to figure things out because it, it not everyone had a full preseason. You know, everyone's preseason was abbreviated by by one thing or another. So, um, just time, just in time, the squad will cut, start coming into form, and and I think that eventually we'll have, you know, kind of like what we saw last year, we'll have lineup problems as far as figuring out who's going to be on the field. I think right now we're still in that, you know, we're putting people on the field. Just we only have, you know, 15, 16 players to field. So just going out there and putting whoever fits. But sooner rather than later, I think that we'll have uh, uh, not us. We don't we don't have any responsibility, but Hutch will have the <laughs> responsibility of uh, of putting, uh, you know, having to figure out uh, who's going to be best and, and having some competition out there, you know, some competition and trying to, to see who, who's going to be out there. And I think that that'll be good as far as depth goes. And as far as just people being motivated and informed. To, yeah. to, to answer the question though, it is only seven. So like, only, you can only name a sub of seven on the bench or wow. Holy crap. A bench of seven subs is, like what you're allowed to name. So yeah, we get five subs, but you can only name seven in the in the match day squad. It's still mm-hmm. eighteen total. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it is only six outfield players if you include a keeper um on the bench. So it's a and little it bit is of a still strange. Five subs in three it windows. It is, yeah. 
five okay. subs in in three instances, not counting halftime. Right. So. Yep. Yeah, it is a bit weird that they haven't made the bench like larger, allowing more subs. But you know, that's neither here nor there. And we've had some academy boys on the bench. That's how thin the squad is right now. And I know I've been seeing people like clamoring for Chapa and all this. And it's like he's not not playing because Hutch doesn't like him or something. Like yeah. he literally had surgery. So there's not a conspiracy against anyone's favorite player. Not that I think Steve's asking that, but just things I've been seeing on social media. People are like, why is this person not playing? Blah, blah, blah. This person keeps starting. Like he doesn't have a whole lot of choices. Like people need to get healthy. Need to get get some minutes in their legs and training first before we throw them out there. So yeah, yeah. The uh, the squad will will probably feel uh quite a bit quite a bit deeper when we have a a handful of these names back, and we'll be able to. There will be you know household names that are that are not in the match day squad, which is pretty pretty shocking um but um the uh that that rounds out our our listener questions i believe um so we'll we'll take another quick break and then we'll be back for the preview of las vegas lights um winners over phoenix uh and and see what locomotive can expect out of this one the Seriously Loco Match Preview. Welcome back, everyone. Well, guys, we've got Vegas. It's a midweek game. Uh, feels early. You know, we we had an October of game every three days uh, last season. Now we're getting now we're getting it in March already. Um, third game of the season on a Wednesday night. Um, against Las Vegas Lights, and it f- happens to fall in the international break, which has impacted Locomotive a couple of times, but Mika, this time around, it's impacting us a little bit more heavily than normal. Yeah, man, we have four internationals who have been called up um, by their national team, so Diego Luna will join um, one of the, I think the U20 set up, is that right? Yeah. Uh, of the U.S. men's national team. Uh, he's already in Argentina right now. Um, John Brown has been called up for Granada. I, I put the Bermuda flag. I have no fucking clue why, but <laughs> forgive me, Siobhan. Uh, he's been called up by his nation as well. Um, Calvillo, we know, uh, fixture in that El Salvador lineup. Um, already headed to El Salvador as well. And then, who am I missing? Uh, Francois. Francois with Haiti. Thank you. So Francois will also join um, up with his national side. So, I mean, that's pretty awesome. Like, the fact that we have ca- players of that caliber that play for their countries, um, yeah, it hurts us in the, the short term. But uh, I was tweeting back and forth with one of our listeners, and they're like, that's what we want. Like, that's great for El Paso. And I was like, I fully agree. I mean, the fact that we have that, that caliber of player in our in our squad, sure, like, we'll miss them. You know, now we're like really <laughs> bare bones uh, skeleton crew for Wednesday, but it's awesome that that we've got guys that are that good that that their nations have called them up for for international duty. So, um, as far as how that you know impacts locomotive, we'll have to shuffle the deck quite a bit. Uh, and I think that I could see the consternation on Hutch's face about that one for sure. <laughs> well, along those lines, and and Christian, I might throw this this your way first but at mark ponce two on twitter asked we're only two games into a new style and look the upside is evident uh what few changes do you anticipate before wednesday especially with the international call-ups um christian so looking at uh looking at the lineup against against new mexico we obviously we know a handful of people are going to be out so taking that into account how do you think we're going to look uh, on wednesday night against vegas yeah, I mean, I've been pondering it, you know, looking at the roster and stuff and and how we've we've come out in the last two matches and it's I am perplexed to say the least. <laughs> <laughs> um I I think we'll see maybe some sort of different formation cuz I, I I don't I don't see how we 
come out in the same shape and the same roles uh, with all these key pieces missing. You know, we Richie will, will be you know where he was against new uh, against uh, Sacramento, replacing Calvillo um, with Diego out. You know, and and likely no Velasquez. You know that that's going to leave a hole there that I'm guessing Dylan will have to fill in. You know. Um, if we don't have uh, someone on the on the left wing uh, with Francois, and I don't think we have anyone else that that can, you know, do the same job that he's been doing um, in in the last two weeks. And and who else? Are we, who did I forget now? Oh, and and we don't have a, a right back. Um, I mean, I, I think we could shift someone around. You know. Maybe someone from the left, maybe Borelli will get a start. Um, or, you know, probably just have to do someone who's not necessarily comfortable on that side of the field. But like you said, it, it's just whoever's available, throw a body out there. So I don't know if, if few changes is the right is the right way to put it, because I think it's <laughs> going to be um, a pretty severe, uh, drastic change from what we've seen so far. Well, I wanted to ask, I guess, first, because my thought is like, you know, best case scenario, talking about the kind of going back to front. So we've got Siobhan John Brown is is out on international duty. So we know that that right back right back spot needs to be filled. It would be filled best case scenario by Harry Brockbank, I think. Um, but Mika and, and maybe Christian what sense did you guys get of uh, Piotis's fitness and how close is he co- to coming back? Because I'm thinking what we might see, if he's fit, obviously I think he'll be in there, but if he's not, we could see Egaluth and Boehner pair in, in the center of defense with Brockbank out on the right. That's what I thought as well. I wasn't able to get any uh, information on Piotis. I gather, I think that it's precautionary uh, just because he did take, um, you know, he did go down late against Sacramento, but he trained. So, um, you know, he trained the following week. So I'm hoping that that was just precautionary, but no, I couldn't tell you exactly what it is that, that kept him out of the side. But that's how I think of it is that, you know, Newton will probably start. It'll be a back line of, of Fox, Egulus, Payares and Brockbank, um, and may- maybe Boehner in there as well, since we he deputized there last time out for a couple minutes. Uh, if Payares isn't ready, but midfield is is tricky for sure. Uh, Chapa won't be ready. I think Richie's got to start in the six. Yeah. Um, Velasquez, that's doubtful as well. So. I mean, do we go like four, four, fucking two? Like, I don't know. <laughs> like, we have to take a body out of midfield, maybe. Um, it's 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 tricky. But I mean, on the wings, Hines, Nick Hines could play. Yeah. Um, I think Ricky can go back to the wing. He was pretty isolated as a number nine, so I don't know that. You know, it's just one game. I'm not gonna say that that doesn't suit him necessarily, but he played really well on the on the right when when he had the chance in California. So, I think we could do with the two of them on the wings while our um you know and Sinube is still going to be here so but I don't know he's been kind of like being worked pretty hard so I don't know if he'll switch sides or what or yeah. just you know sit but um yeah there might be a rejig as far as like the shape but yeah it's midfield looks tricky I, yeah I think the Luna spot is the only one I'm really having trouble filling because I could see a scenario where we have I Honestly, I I think Gomez may get a chance to start up top um, mm. with with Hines and uh, Sanube either side. Sanube obviously, you know, he's played big minutes in in both games, but I think he's come off in both games. So I, you know, he hasn't been stretched like a full ninety. Mm, um, right. So, I mean, we could go like four two three one where. Egulus and Richie are the sixes, and then Mars in the hole, and then Boehner at the back. I think that's the way you get everyone in like a position that they like, <laughs> yeah, um, or that they can play without like moving someone totally wild. You know what I mean? Sure. But, yeah. Yeah. The it it really is 
it really is that that Diego spot that's just like who else plays there like because I think you could you know you could envision like you said if Chop is healthy if Velasquez is healthy like you could envision them playing in that sort of role um but without either of them it's like mm-hmm. there's not really like a natural replacement not that there's really a natural replacement for either of them because I think Luna and Mares are each other's <laughs> best replacement <laughs> <laughs> if that makes sense, like they right. they filled that role better than anyone, and that's why they're there. But it also, yeah, there's not like natural depth for Luna. And I think if Calvillo was around, you could see him stepping into that spot, but he's obviously not. So, anyways, right. yeah, that's where it does get a little bit tricky. We could see maybe he tries to get a little bit. Maybe he does go four two three one, and then one of, or maybe, I mean four two four or something like that with like, Ooh. I, and Too I said, which is PSG. kind of a four four. It's kind of a four four two. <laughs> you know, however you want to slice it, but yeah. with you know Hines on the left, Sanupe on the right, and then Gomez and Zacharias both like up top, rather than a, a third midfielder. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's a it I don't know, it's interesting although the idea of a Dylan Richie double pivot is so, somewhat like making my brain like separate in half. Um <laughs> just cuz I don't know that I don't know what that looks like, so um Well, I, I think I was saying in a 4-2-3-1 Dylan as the 10. Oh, okay. And then Richie and Eggyloose as the 6s, the double pivot. And then Boehner in the in center of defense. Okay. That the problem with and that Pyaris, is that, that moves a lot of people. Like, that, that shifts the whole team up. Does that bank and on so, Pyaris being healthy? That banks on well? Pyaris being healthy. Okay. Yeah. So that's the problem. We don't know. Yeah. It's a lot of movement. Christian, you a had lot. you had something else as well. No, no, I was just I was just agreeing with Mika. I liked the I liked what she was putting out there. Yeah. No, I like I I love the idea of of Ander getting a a shot in midfield because I I feel like he wants that, but he's also mm-hmm. been he's also been very good at center back. He's been so really I, good, like <laughs> yeah. He's, I think, anyway. he's that low key kind of uh, defender who just like sees sees off danger quite quite easily, just like unflappable. So. Um, he, I, mean, I think he I plays, said this to you guys. Is he, yeah. uh, he feels to me like the least chaotic central defender we've ever had. <laughs> yeah, I would I would say that. So, although you know, back in the Chiro days, he 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 exuded that kind of like calmness. But true, true. But true. no, Ander Ander definitely feels like a different level. Well. It'll be really interesting to see what what Hutch comes up with, but obviously a handful of problems to solve with with maybe some some differing pieces. And coming into a game that was made a little bit more complicated on its face by the fact that Vegas is coming off a win at home against Phoenix. Um, And, I mean, Christian, Danny Trejo on the score sheet for... Vegas as well. Danny Trejo Machete. And for... <laughs> <laughs> Head on the tortoise. <laughs> no, I mean I, I I mean, obviously congrats to them for, for that result. I mean that's a very enviable result for any team in the West to, to have in their belt. But um I think that all that, that really shows us is that in this league, you know, Anything can happen on on any given match night. Um, you know, we could we could go out and you know later this year and and smash Tampa Bay. You know, it could happen. I'm not saying it will. It might, might not. But I'd, like I said, it just goes to show you that that anything can happen, and, and it's a you know it's a, a long season, so no one result can really be given too much weight here. Um, not uh, I will be fair with Vegas and say that they they played a pretty good match their first time out too against uh against New Mexico so so they they look probably better than they have in the last couple of years so not a not a team to be taken lightly of course um, but I think that um, 
we just got they've just got to come out and and really get that results again not not a you know a do or die game by any means but i think it's important to to get a win here a draw at the very least but you know it it's time for for them to get that win i think that'll do wonders for them yeah third time's the charm let's hope anyway um I agree with Christian. Anything can happen. Anyone can catch a body in USL Championship. But <laughs> I thought I thought lights are a good value. Um, obviously, it's an upset two one. You know, everyone. I think I think the bookies all had you know Phoenix winning over the hometown team. To be fair, yeah. Um, and and you could argue Phoenix maybe deserved more from the match. You know, based on XG and all and what have you. But Vegas were clinical with the chances they did get. I mean, there was not a whole lot of respect shown to Lights in the way that Phoenix played with that really high line. And, and, you know, they are a better team on paper, so I'm not necessarily blaming them, but it did cost them. Uh, The first goal, for example, that's just excellent pressing by Lights, forcing the the Phoenix midfielder into a mistake, and they hit him on the counter. Hit him on the counter a lot. Like, there was a. and, And I could see us using that as a blueprint for how to approach Phoenix in the future but i mean either way um maybe we're coming up against a side that is similar to us and in, in how they want to play i mean danny trejo one goal one assist great dribbler um a little bit older than diego but i can see like similarities in the way that they play um and yeah he was really really good lights had some luck too though i mean quinn probably should score from a free kick but it hits the post yeah. um you know a couple other times there where they could have conceded and then it ends up being very close to one so um yeah i mean we joked last time out you know lads it's las vegas but you know in all seriousness <laughs> like um you know they they are you know in this league for a reason and they've got some players about them, and, and they're going to come into the swap with some confidence. So um, I do think we have what it takes to beat them, but maybe maybe the uh, lack of options as far as personnel could sting us, to be honest. So, um, yeah, this one's, this one's kind of weird. A bit of a banana peel vibe about it, I think. Yeah, I think the concern, too, is, like, on the back of a – of getting beat by like a pretty like hit and hope, a lot of fouls, breaking up play, like that sort of performance uh, by, by United. The idea of, I mean, this is a more stylish version. Um, you know, lights completed, you know, more than 200 passes. So there's at least, you know, they did play the game of football at times. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and I think in this one, like the concern for me is, is that we've, we've kind of gotten done on the counter or in some of these kind of like transition moments. We, we've, we've gotten beat now in two games. So, cleaning that up quickly against lights and, and getting to a point where we're yeah. Dealing with the danger. I think it's going to be really important. And on, on with a short turnaround, it, it'll be tough to, to rectify some of the things that we, that we saw against New Mexico. But all that being said, I think one of the things working in our favor is we, we are, well, we've learned some hard lessons early on in the season and I think I think there's value in that. I think there's value too in the fact that the team will be looking to put things right pretty quickly after, you know, the I think they'll relish the opportunity to turn around and play this game um to to kind of get the bad taste out of their mouth from United and then I think the other uh the other thing is I mean this is a home match and Vegas did start with two straight home games, I think. Um, so this is their first trip on the road, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, no, they went they went up to Albuquerque. Oh, did they? 
Yeah. Oh, that's right. It, yeah, I should yeah. have remembered from the broadcast one because you know obviously they make a lot of it, but secondly because you could barely <laughs> you could barely see what was happening for portions of the game because the sun is right down the, the camera sun. still um, <laughs> somehow. So, anyways, um, yeah, my bad. So they they lost in Albuquerque, and it was like they showed some signs, I think, but it was overall pretty comfortable for New Mexico. Um, so I'm hoping that we can similarly uh, deal with Vegas here and, and make it comfortable for ourselves uh, with them away away from home again. But with that being said, it does it does bring us to the pick'em of it all. And uh, and Christian, um, where where do things stand? It's been a it's been a brutal start, obviously, because uh, you know. Anytime locomotive is losing, we're not we're not doing so hot in the pick'em. But uh, where do things stand, and then uh, and then we can go ahead and get into our predictions for for Vegas. Yeah, I mean, well, along with with locomotive, we all took an L uh, last <laughs> week. There, there was you know, none of us picked a, picked a loss, and um, none of us counted on on Dylan to put one in the net. So. Mistake um, made. <laughs> with that being <laughs> said, uh, results hold from week one, which means Mika uh, is in the lead with one point, while Phil, Austin, and I are still waiting to uh, to open our account this year. Well, um, did we always start? Did we start with last place or do we start with first place? We usually start with last place, but okay. I mean. So I mean, three way tie. tie for that right now. So <laughs> go ahead and do the honors, Phil. Okay. Well, I'll, <laughs> I'll get it started then. Um, so I do think, given the fact that, um, given the fact that we have uh, given up some cheap goals, I, I'm not. I'm not quite at the predicting a clean sheet um, point <laughs> in my in my life yet. Um, so I do think we'll win. Um, I think I think we we turn it around on Vegas. I think injecting some new uh, or not injecting some new life, but I think I think bringing in some of the players who uh, like Gomez, who he obviously just saw the last like half hour. I think the idea of, of him getting involved in things from the start um, is is exciting and having a, you know, a recognized striker who also does a hell of a lot of work off the ball and, and can really, to me, like that false nine position suits him down to the ground. So I'd love to see him play in that, in that sort of role. Anyways, that's, that's uh, neither here nor there as I think, um, I think we do get the win. I think some of those players coming in, make a difference. Um, and but I will say it will be close. Um, I think we have, I think we'll have some chances, but I think we'll we'll score two. Um, so I'll say two one, and I will I will go for, um, I'll go for for uh, Emmanuel to to stay hot um, and get on the score sheet again because um, he's. He's looking. He's looking like a dangerous fella. So, I'm thinking he's gonna get the job done against Vegas. Okay, I'll I'll go next, and then and then we'll have Mika round it out. But I think that uh, I'm I'm counting on history to repeat itself a little bit here. And if you think back to 2019, it was match day three where we got our first uh our first point at home. We we'd gotten a point in match day two away to Monarchs. Um in that first season, but, uh, match day three, we came back and, uh, we were up 2-0 against RGV and then they came back and, and had that draw against us, but it was still a first home point nonetheless. Uh, and I think that's where we'll head this one. Um, I think that, uh, we'll stay consistent. I think we'll put one in the net. I think it'll be a one, one draw. Um, just like, cause like you said, Phil, I don't think this is, you know, the, the clean sheet squad that we're used to. So that just might be something that people have to adjust to. Um, but I think that, that we'll manage to, to hold on to, to the lead this time. Um, 
with that being said, I, I have to agree with you. I think the, the smart money is on Sanupe, um, you know, who, who could have, you know, five, five goals, uh, across the three matches if, if things were going in the net, but I think that, that he finds it and makes it work this week. Mika. Okay. You guys make fair points about the clean sheets. That was a little bit naive of me, wasn't it? Um, <laughs> I mean, it was looking good for, like, 35 minutes. <laughs> I think uh, looking back at this fixture, we haven't played lights really that much, actually. It's been, like, a handful of times or many many fixtures between us were canceled due to COVID. Um, but Josue Aron Gomez has scored three goals in this fixture. So I'm going with, with Aron. Um spoke really well at the press conference about you know us needing to be better and just put put Saturday behind us and and all of the players and the coach were um effusive in the fact that this is a blessing that we've got such a quick turnaround because it's another opportunity to show the fans really what they want to do um their style of play and and hopefully a, a dub so I'm gonna go 2-1 same as Phil and I think Gomez will be one of the guys to to score it, or maybe even score a brace. Last time we played them, he scored a brace, but I'll I'll pick him to score at least one. Yeah, uh, in the infamous uh, Winalda Winalda match uh, where he walked off <laughs> on you know whatever right. eighty seven minutes or whatever. <laughs> My goodness! Oh, what a time! What a time to be alive! Well, no, I, I, I think we're, um, I think we're split now. So me and me and Mika, uh, me and Mika said wins. Christian and and Austin uh, predicted a draw. Austin predicting a one-one with an, a Josue Aron Gomez goal. So a nice little spread here. But I think we're we're focused on on, uh. And even in my comments, focused on Gomez and and how he'll link up with with Sanupe. I think it'll be interesting to see uh, how this Hutch side lines up. But like we said during the listener question portion, it's not quite time to ring the alarm bells, press the panic button, how whichever whichever method of alarm you've chosen. Um, but it could be time to press the follow. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Jesus. Uh, getting as corny as possible. But yeah, uh, if if uh, you have enjoyed, as I said at the top of the podcast, follow along on whichever your favorite podcast platform is. You can follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. We're on all of them um, at Seriously Loco or on Instagram at, at Seriously underscore Loco. Um, and uh yeah, for for this one, I think uh are you guys in the building again for this one? I will be, yeah. Cool, cool. So we'll have SL representatives at the uh at the uh the pressers and 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 uh in the press box, but I mean, I wanted to give a little shout out little uh for anyone who listened to the press conf- press conference audio um Mika and <laughs> and company as as we are now known uh thanks to <laughs> thanks new to face <laughs> of the new face of the organization <laughs> I know I was shook I was like I was wearing a mask and like I didn't think he remembered or cared or whatever <laughs> like especially given the circumstances I was like I'm, he's just staring at a bunch of people asking him annoying ass questions on like the worst day of his life arguably <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, he uh he gave us a shout out. It was pretty interesting. Yeah, but he he shout literally out to the clubs oh. though for or for t- to the to the club for bringing back the in person press conferences. That just hits different, I have to say. Yeah. Yeah, it was a fun experience for sure. I was just going to say like it it really was the worst day of his life it feels. He literally compared it to him losing his dog. So <laughs> Holy yeah. shit. That yeah. verbatim that was his that was his feelings on the night. So, yeah. so yeah, we're, uh, we'll, we'll be present and hopefully, hopefully Hutch will be in better spirits this time after, a, after a nice result. But, uh, but either way, 
um, yeah, make sure you check us out. Check out our Patreon if you if you're so inclined. Um, and uh, we will be back after the lights match to to wrap it all up and and look ahead. And we'll be we'll be around all season. You won't be able to get rid of us. Um, so until until next time, guys, stay loco. <laughs>